I love the Chopin Nocturnes, but he's not the only one who's written them. It just means music of the night somehow, and it's often calm and collected pieces with a singing melody over broken chords. And half a century after Chopin's death, still in France, Gabriel Faure wrote piano music that goes further in exploring the chromatic depth of counterpoint while retaining a lyrical and radiant surface. He's written 13 nocturnes and 13 barcarolles that kind of constitutes the main bulk of his piano repertoire and the 6th nocturne in D-flat major is considered one of his greatest. It's a substantial piece of music, almost 9 minutes long, with 3 different textural ideas with different tempi and time signatures and seemingly endless modulation. But it comes together very nicely and it says something incredibly beautiful that can't be expressed in the tonal language of Chopin. I'm gonna play the whole first section, so just take in this music and I'm gonna give my take on it in the analysis section that follows. Enjoy! This piece was a request by my Patreon sponsor, Mr. S. Lamb, so a big shout out to him for making me play this. So let's start with the melody in the beginning. So it's kind of a floating feeling of not exactly clear where the meter is, but I actually feel it as uh, it's a clear sequence of two beats at a time that repeats and going downward. So that's the two beats and then it's kind of the same contour and repeating and then the third time it's kind of expanded the unit to three beats so there we get into this real triple time but of course it's kind of written like this to be evasive of these clear downbeats but anyway that's the melodic material and then the harmony it starts to get tricky if we look at the bass, it's <laughs> it's almost um, too good to be true, uh, just keeping the D flat tonality because the, the chords doesn't match this at all. But let's uh, start from the back. It's actually a clear cadence in the end here. We have, it's the D flat 4, 5, 1. We have the 4, the G flat. And then we have the A flat, the dominant seven to the D flat. But he delays the resolution of the chord, the bass resolves to D flat, but we keep the A flat dominant. So it's a A flat over D flat, and then resolves the harmony as well. And before that, D flat. This is the dominant, but with an F on top. It's kind of a, like a 13th chord. Sometimes I call it the dominant 7 add 6, because some, a 13th chord, maybe you should have the 9 there, but for simplicity's sake, I call it the 13th chord. 
And, and this is like a typical French cadence and you have it everywhere in 4A. So that's the end of the phrase. Now in the beginning, the first chord is D flat major also. And then F minor. So, so with this G natural, it feels almost more in F minor than D flat major. And then this B flat minor seven. And here, this C half diminished is really kind of unstable mystical chord. So here we get back the G flat and not the G natural anymore. So this chord really makes it keep going away. And the bass continues up to D flat. And this is, now we're connecting the two parts. The melodic sequence keeps going, connecting it, but now also the harmony. This is a D flat 11 that clearly points to D flat. So then it's connected uh, in a traditional way as well. It's just super nice with all these uh, chord flavors all the time. Let's do the whole phrase again. On the way home. Stability. And he really needs this like a full bar of only the D flat with the uh, A flat over D flat on the first beat to really rest on this harmony. Okay, that's the first phrase. We're only three bars in and it's happened so much already. Second phrase, now it's only two bars. It's a shorter phrase. Let's play it first. So again, it comes to rest on a stable harmony and it starts on an A flat first inversion as well, A flat 7. And here, this is a B flat 7 first inversion with this nice dark arpeggiatura. And continuing so, a B flat. 7 points to E flat and with this appoggiatura it kind of points to E flat minor because the D flat is the third in the E flat minor and the bass follows the harmonic order goes to E flat but the melody deviates and goes to C flat <laughs> so this is the big surprising chord turns it into a C flat major first inversion or a B major and harmonically spelled as C flat because we're in flat land. But we go kind of back immediately to a known territory. A flat in the bass, F minor on the first beat, and then A flat uh, major seven on the second beat. It makes more sense in context because now the next phrase starts the same way as this. The only, only difference is we get the C flat straight away, turns this hole into a diminished chord, but the same C flat. And now when the melody shoots up, it reaches higher to this. It's a D flat nine. And then we get this magical switch to this B double flat major or an harmonically equivalent to A major. And the third beat we see, it's A major, the same notes, just differently spaced. So amazing shift here. It sets up, it paves the way for an answering phrase that's a bit longer. It starts on A major. We recognize the end, it's the exact same as the first phrase, and actually the whole melodic material is the same, but it's cast in a completely different harmonic suit. Because it's modulate uh, halfway through. But the first steps 
we're in A major to this lovely chord. Uh, the bass goes just A, D, E, A and 1, 4, 5, 1. And it's kind of the same cadential progression with some extra flavor notes, of course. D is a 4 in A, subdominant, but with a major 7, the C sharp. Like a typical for a thing. Then E, dominant, but it's an E11, it still counts. Here we get the third to A, but immediately it's A7, so continuing pointing forward to it. Now this is a pure diminished chord, uh, B flat diminished to E flat 7 and to this French cadence A13 to the resolving to D flat. Um, it's actually quite straightforward. It's only one trick that Fourier does. He puts the bass offset on syncopation. So if I play the bass on the beat, it's more clear that it's only a B diminished, modulating back to E flat to A flat to D flat. But he delays the bass and it contributes to this kind of floating, unclear feeling. Until the A flat. So we get to rest a little bit again. Now we're halfway through the first section, the first page. Now for the second part of the first section, it gets slightly more expanded. The harmonic movements are relentless. It's a clear A flat 7, dominant to D flat again. We're just reaching it by some strange means from D flat, half diminished to diminished to D. Second inversion to A flat. So it's a tritone move, D to A flat. Really cool and Fourier kind of uses the inner voices to, to create this A flat. It's a sus4 as well, A flat 7, the D flat. So it's a, the inner voice goes like D to D flat to see um, the voice leading there. Now we get this sequence uh, repeated. So this time it reaches another dominant 7, it's a B7 that points to E and we have already E in the bass uh, and this time from A flat 7 it kind of goes straight as a deceptive cadence to A minor. Like A minor, first inversion, with this uh, tense appoggiatura on the sharp fourth. Uh, flirting with a C7, but going back to A minor. A minor and C are relative keys. It's just really ambitious uh, harmonic moves here. From A minor is not that far away to this B dominant that we get here. So in general, this section, it expands the texture. You see the right hand is much higher up and thicker chords. Now we get the sequence for a third time and now it kind of resolves to where the dominant is pointing. To E major. Bass goes up to first inversion, and so the appoggiatura is on the two going to three and to one, but immediately it turns this E major to a D sharp seven to a C sharp. So E uh, this kind of it's a C sharp nine. It's also close to a G sharp minor. Uh, but 
Yeah. So, and now it gets even more accidental all the time. But from here on, C sharp is the enharmonic equivalent to D flat. So we're starting to get flats now again. It means we're going back to the tonality of D flat major. So G, G flat, but diminished. If the bass didn't move, it would be a resolution to G flat. Um, same appoggiatoras as before, but diminished and bass keeps keeps it moving forward with a B flat seven. We've had this before as well, and with a dark appoggiatura to E flat. And here the melody just goes wild with a. Uh, distant melody appoggiatoras. But the bass is in uh, non territory. E flat 7 to A flat. And here you see immediately all the accidentals disappear. <laughs> so we're in D flat tonality. And here, four it just pulls out all the stops of an extended cadence. So it's uh, A flat, the dominant, but it's a 6 4. D flat with A flat in the bass. And some nice uh, kind of inverted fanfare going down here. A flat 7. And the same thing, A flat 7, but the bass resolves first. pianistic things oh. and it resolves to D flat in the very last note of this section so I'm not going to do the whole piece in as much detail but let's look a little bit at the different sections at least so the second section starts here after a fermata sounds like this as a song. So again, really hard to pin down what's happening. Uh, it's a different kind of energy with the accompaniment on the off beats. And the meter is kind of hard to catch in the beginning. I think it makes sense to think of it as the first two bars as one hemiola of a bigger three time bar. And then three uh, normal triple time bar here. But again, the harmonic moves are really kind of hard to track. It's going forward and some, at some points you can have stability, for example, towards the end of this. And going back to... So C sharp minor is where it starts. It's kind of a, an harmonically flip from D flat, going from D flat major to, to the minor. But it's easier to spell C sharp minor than D flat minor. Here we have this uh, 13th chord again. This. Just as a passing. Now crescendo going somewhere. have a stable point it's going to E major as a relative of C sharp minor and again we have a clear uh, the last part of the harmonic progression is quite clear A as a 4 to 5 to 1 in E major and again we have A major 7 the major 7 on the 4 So then we get like a second part of this B section. So kind of the left hand and the right hand are in dialogue a bit and we get this 
it's all the time like short melodic sequences that repeat and sometimes uh, well a lot of the times the harmony goes somewhere that's not uh, what you'd expect so for example it's G7 it's like pointing back to C sharp minor but then going to this A7 in the 7 in the bass it's like some oscillation between those and then somewhere B flat major maybe diminished half diminished it's really hard to I I don't really know where it's going I just know that it's going somewhere and that's the important thing it's just kind of searching it's foggy around it that's the the clouded part of 4a but anyway uh, eventually we get to this point we get a sequence that repeats this way upward exact same ending uh, as the end of the first section uh, recognize the textures and these uh, suspensions um, well it's all the way to the last part of the cadence and then it takes a new turn of course so the first time we go to an A flat 7 here go to back to D, D flat major but now it's like it's B flat minor 7 it yeah and uh, augmented and lovely minor major seven a minor major sevens and finally <laughs> it takes a, an extended detour but somehow finds its way back to a flat and d flat in the end again so Lovely. And same thing here, A flat 7, bass resolve to D flat as a pedal point. And reach D flat. So that's the B section. It's um, like more things happening and it's more energy than uh, the first, kind of a li little bit calmer nocturne feeling. And here we reach the third section, the C section, we can call it. And it's again completely new contrasting material. It's Allegro Moderato, new time signature, and new texture of 16th notes. Uh, it's a lovely thing. It sounds like this. So this is D flat major, but then it flips here and the soaring melody enters in A major. cadence here on E 13th version French cadence to A so there are some uh, you know cool harmonic moves here I'm not gonna go into detail but this whole section like the character of it reminds me so much of Foray's Requiem the last movement there in Paradiso uh, just to give you an idea that sounds it's like the same it, it starts like this and then the sopranos enters and it's like not a problem in the world just enjoy paradise it's the text here uh, in the end of the requiem and he uses the d major with a six here and it's kind of the same here it's a major it's a little bit more pianistic uh, uh, more intense paradise 
midi and move to C major. But it's A major with a six as well. Yeah. Okay, this goes on for a while, it repeats, and then we start to feel like kind of a developmental feeling because Foray starts to integrate uh, material from the B section with the C section. So after a while we get this. It's actually really cool because the first time it's in triple time and now it's like a big four bar. It's kind of altering the rhythms slightly but it's really the same material as when we have it here. Now it's uh, like this. And now it's like a struggle between the two textures because now we get these bursts of 16th notes and scales. Again, back. scale that time and after this we get like a longer chunk of this B section but it's uh, going to some different it's not an exact repetition it's going different ways but it's the same kind of chromatic tension here continues and takes the sequences in a like a in new positions. So it's a, I haven't memorized it. I, I would dread to memorize this because it's uh, so weird. And it's cool. And here, instead of getting a climax, it's just a abrupt change back to the Paradiso feeling. Now we get scales in the left hand, lovely, lovely, underneath this appoggiatura. This is really good piano writing, joy to play. Again, French 13th cadence. Again, same. And now we're gonna keep on building, kind of start over. And now we use the last part of the Paradiso melody with a big triplet. Uh, just take that. And it's uh, another of these like outrageous harmonic progressions where the chords, it's really hard to make them fit together in a functional way. But I don't think that's how it's meant to be. It's just a sequence that's repeated. It goes upward. So here it starts on A. Go to C7. And then this, this pair of A and C is repeated higher. So now B to D7 and now continue one whole note higher to D flat. And finally, the fourth time now, the bass starts to drop down again. Some kind of E flat, sus. to G flat major 7 to E flat minor 9 all the way to A flat and this is like the biggest climax of the piece I'm, I will try to play it together uh, but here look at the bass This is actually kind of a hidden recapitulation from material from the first section, uh, this like second phrase. So 
that melodic content is now cast in the bass. But it's completely different character with the texture of the 60s notes. The 60s notes are thinning out here. And so these, like, I don't, I play octaves. I keep playing octaves here. I really don't understand why Foray didn't write them out. Why not flesh it out? Here it's an octave again. So this is A major, second inversion. This is the end of like the whole middle section, the development, it's another pause, and then it's recapitulation of the first section that's more, a, a bigger chunk that's the same. But first let's play this uh, build up to the climax. long time and then recap of the first more nocturnal feeling but it's without bass The bass enters on this syncopation, it's now more syncopated than the first time. So we get a repeat of this material all the way to the end and then it's like a small coda with the same character and texture. So after this, this is the second way that we've had before. Now we go here. and. This is the start of the coda, or codetta, if it's so uh, closely connected. Here is the final outrageous harmonic progression with chords that's really distant. But uh, the counterpoint is like the melodic positions are primary. And it's this uh, appoggiatoras as well. But the bass goes down chromatically. Every chromatic note down to A flat and then the resolution to D flat and the harmony goes just whatever chords matches this chromatic in a way um, and repeating the melodic sequence yeah it kind of sounds wrong so point is here to, to make a diminuendo to A flat. So the resolution comes even sweeter when it's been so far out before. Let's do it one more time. Here it sounds like a Chopin nocturne for half a bar to here again. So now we're at the final stretch. Now it's basically we've established the D flat and the A flat in the bass. It's the final cadence. Then four A just plays with two notes. So. C and E flat, that's part of A flat, the dominant goes to D flat. But it plays with C flat going to C natural and E flat and E flat. So it plays with these over these different bass notes and he like he tries all the different combinations. 
So we get these amazing and dotissimo, super sweet, amazing types of cadences, uh, flavor of the, the chords here. So the final one is a clear A flat augmented C and the plus five to D flat. But like all the other, we have a D, nine, and then E, when we have this combination, A flat, A flat minor, <laughs> to A flat augmented, and a nice rest bar with only D flat. end the piece in a calm way. It's really spectacular music. I mean the harmony might seem kind of wild and far-fetched with all the weird chromatic moves, sudden modulations and non-diatonic sequences, but Foray guides us gently back all the time and it actually makes sense tonally on an underlying deeper level. I can't explain how it is and how it works on every corner of the piece because it's too much work for a video like this, but if you're interested, there is a master thesis by Hoi Wai Lin from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And she attempts this and goes through the whole piece thoroughly over like a hundred pages. And I'm going to close this up by reading a quote from her thesis. A Schenkerian analysis of this nocturne reveals a surface in which the dimensions of harmony, melody, meter form, both individually and in various combinations, are by no means perfectly concordant. That is why the music sounds somewhat outside the tradition for which this type of analysis was designed. At the same time, it is possible to see how, allowing for a certain amount of conceptual freedom, it is possible to sidestep some of the many loose ends produced by a proliferation of fascinating details and to reveal a tight design of an essentially traditional cast. It presents us with a delightful equilibrium between innovation and tradition, the clouded and the clear, the conflicted and the concordant. Thanks for watching Sonata Secrets, I'll see you in the next video.